Madam President, members of conference, friends, it's a great honour to introduce to you today your new Vice President. Bala, this is a bit of an unusual way to do your Vice Presidential address. Can you tell us why you've been chosen, to, why you've chosen to be interviewed in this way? Okay. One of my great passions in life is conversation. That's the way I make friends, that's the way I share, and that's the way I learn. I'm not a local preacher, so the interview is a way a layman can give voice, bear testimony, and share what God has done and is doing. Let's dive straight in then. What do you want to bring to the church during the coming year? Above all, I want to meet people and listen to them. I want to engage in the sort of listening and conversation that makes friendships, builds community, and encourages hope. I want to discover what God is calling us to be and to do. I want to meet those people that churches have links with who build better communities. I want to spend time with them and learn from those who are battling injustice and poverty whether they are in the church or not, and whatever faith, I want to ask them, how can we pray for you? So in that context of uh, listening and conversation, what are the challenges that you want to bring to the church? I want to share my passionate conviction that as a church, we are called to confront injustice and poverty wherever we see it and to reach out to the limits of our strength with compassion, practical help, wherever there is suffering. Here's an example of the Methodist Church in Sri Lanka. When the terrible civil war ended in Sri Lanka, I met with some former Tamil Tiger fighters. The Sri Lankan Methodist Church had begun helping them with counseling and livelihood projects. I met one of them again this March, this year. This is what he had to say. In the head, Kandaling and Kupendran, Nan Kokodijola, Vasikindin, Nan Madu Electronics, Miniel, Wagarangal, Tilter, Panida, Pulido to control the rain. Unmaili in the particular periodism, Yutta Tala, Ilarime, Padika Paturaka, Adile, Megabum, Surapaha, Padika Patu, Urlada Ridiaka, Udal Ridiaka, Mutamaha, Padika Pata, Makala, Neradia Chandra, Adapula Tedivi Sayidi, Aba Tangala Ulwangan and Rada Visi, Madun Melian Ravalkela, Marakela, and the Methodist Surgeon and the Visi Dukula Nanga Ulwanga Padama Ledendrinda, Nichi Mahana and Tatin, Tatkolegi Pokudi or Vibu Kuda and the Rikamanajana, Jail and the Vandodan, Manan the Rela Purita, Pakravan and Lam or Edria Papanangala, Kalakiravan Pesamatan, Talekuni to Pova, about Bidoria Pakra Halangalan and the Kala. அந்த காலத்திலே எங்கள எடுத்து உள்வாங்கி அதுக்குள்ள எங்கட உலனல ஆலோசனைகள் ஊடாக எங்கள கட்டியெழுப்பி அதோட பொருளாதார ரீதியான உதவிகளை செய்ததால நிச்சயமாக நான் இந்த இடத்துல இருந்து கலக்கிறதுக்கு எனக்கு வாய்ப்பு கிடைச்சிருக்கு மேலே அது உங்களுக்கு தான் நன்றி சொல்லணும் I did not find the church the methodist church found me those words really struck home the church embraced this guy and other ex-combatants like him. The church was not judgmental. They helped them move beyond the past and gave him and his community hope and dignity. The conversation helped me to understand how our efforts can and do make a difference. So, I will be sharing more of these stories and we'll be bringing the message that we need to play a part in making a difference. But Bali, you'll agree that that's much easier said than done, isn't it? Yes. Well, let me give you another example. In April this year, I went to Italy with the churches together in Britain and Ireland to see the work of the Mediterranean Hope. It's a small project set up by the Federation of Protestant Churches in Italy, of which the Italian Methodists are a vital part. 
the Federation is in conjunction with St. Angelio community and with the endorsement of the Italian government have established humanitarian corridors to bring refugees, mostly from Syria, to Italy safely, swiftly, and to receive them into a hospitable, caring environment. Of course, since my visit, Italy has a new government. Maria Mancio, the president of the Italian Methodist Church, tells me that the new government policies could make it very difficult for the churches to respond to the refugee crisis. She confirmed, however, that the Italian churches remain determined to fulfill God's call to love the stranger. The Methodist Church in Italy wants to continue to work with and for the migrants and refugees at the ecumenical, national and local level through Methodist social projects and through their congregation. She thanked the British Methodists for their prayers and their show of solidarity. This sculpture is in Lampedusa. It's called the Gate of Europe. It's a large open gate with nothing to buy entry. This sculpture embodies the attitude of open welcome. I ask myself, could the UK, could our church respond to the current refugee crisis in the same compassion and generosity? That's an enormous challenge, isn't it? Um, but are there things that are already going on in this country which are starting to respond to it? Yes, there are. And we need to recognize and celebrate and draw inspiration from them. That's another part of what I want to do this year. For instance, I've heard of a family of Syrian refugees being looked after by the Methodist Church in Birmingham. They're the first successful community sponsorship that the church has delivered. And here in Nottingham and other parts of the connection, Methodists are involved in supporting food banks, language cafes for refugees, and joining with other organizations like UK citizens to campaign for change and compassion. There are drop-in centers for Syrian migrants and asylum seekers operating in many places. And in a different situation, we saw the open welcome that Notting Hill Church gave the victims of Grenfell Tower. Mike Long, the minister, persuaded the police to move the cordon so that the Grenfell Tower residents could take refuge in the church in the early hours of the morning of the fire. We are making a difference. We will continue to make a difference. But I think we can do more. So, Bali, your Christian calling is very much driven by your passion for social justice, isn't it? And it's, it's very clear that the kind of individual meetings and encounters and conversations that you describe have had a really big impact on you and opened up a whole new uh, dimension of your, your understanding. I wonder if we could turn to your work as a trustee with Christian Aid, because I know that uh, you've got another important meeting you want to tell us about. Yes. Alongside All We Can, Christian Aid has been profoundly important to me. In my travels, I've had the privilege of meeting people battling poverty and injustice and have been able to show solidarity with them. Not so long ago, I visited the Janasha program that works with the Dalit people in Madhya Pradesh in central India. The Dalits are the lowest caste in India. They have been for centuries victims of the most horrible injustice, subjected to human rights abuse, rape and violence. This is my friend Kranti. Kranti is from a family and community of manual scavengers. Manual scavenging is unprotected work of cleaning and disposing of human feces. This is dangerous, unhealthy and dehumanizing. It is now illegal, but it still goes on because they are forced into it or because they have no other way of making a living. 
county and the Janisha program have worked to eradicate this illegal practice. The Janisha program has liberated these women and helped them to find better ways to support their families. Kanti and the Janachar team have been working through the Indian legal system to bring justice, bring to justice the perpetrators of the atrocities against Dalits. By collecting evidence, keeping records, and preparing victims and witnesses for court appearances, Kanti, a qualified, experienced lawyer, has achieved an impressive record of getting justice for the victims through the Indian courts. Kranti could have, well be, is, could have been a well-paid, high-profile lawyer. So I asked her, why are you doing this? She said, I do this because I'm a woman, because I'm educated, because I'm a Dalit. Her response remains an inspiration to me and deeply humbling. It reduced me to tears. That sounds like it was a really powerful and transforming encounter, Bala. But of course, we're also aware, aren't we, of the poverty and injustice that exists within this country. Yes, indeed. We face poverty and injustice at every point of our lives and in every place. So I ask myself, can this be what God wants for his people? It's not in God's plan that the past year, one in four parents in the UK has skipped a meal in order to afford to feed their children. It is not in God's plan that people are disempowered, unable to make fundamental choices about their health, education, work, or well-being. It is not in God's plan that last year, in this country, child poverty rose to 4.2 million, and it is predicted to get to 5 million by the end of this decade. As Christians, and especially Methodists, we cannot ignore it. I believe God's plan is that we should all have the ability to flourish and live out the potential God has placed on us. But for too many people, poverty makes this impossible. And sadly, many churchgoers and the general public have come to believe that the key factors driving poverty in the UK are the personal failings of the poor, especially idleness and living off the state. This is so wrong. We need to open their eyes to it. This thinking, by the way, is not new. John Wesley challenged it in 1753. So, doing something about it is deep in our Methodist DNA. John Wesley said, so wickedly, devilishly false is that common objection, they are only poor because they are idle. So devilishly wicked. Powerful words. A church that abandons the poor is no longer the church of Jesus Christ. And we do abandon the poor if we don't challenge these ideas. In Luke 6.20, Jesus says, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. We need to recognize that deep truth. Only as we stand in solidarity with the poor can we share the kingdom of God. Amen. So it's there in the Bible and in our Methodist tradition. How might this work out in the everyday life of our churches? Let me give you an example of the impact of the new welfare benefit, universal credit on the poor, that illustrates this. It is from my own superintendent, David Hardman. A new father came to my door. He was struggling, waiting for a delayed universal credit payment and doing his best to keep his family going. The food bank had helped, 
but his baby needed nappies and other supplies and he just did not have the money for it. The church bought what the baby needed and I made sure that he had money on his travel card so that he could continue to look for work without being sanctioned. Of course it's right that we helped this family and others like his family, but we shouldn't need to do it and certainly not so often. So, the need is enormous. We need to get to the roots of such injustice. I know you want to talk about a, another a couple of examples from your own uh, experience. Yes, these are also about people who are overlooked or forgotten. I'm a trustee of the Methodist Homes, born out of Christian concern 75 years ago. We often remember the residents in our care homes. But what of the staff? Methodist Homes is a progressive employer. In spite of this significant funding gap, it pays its staff the minimum real living wage. That's nearly 12% higher, and in London, 30% higher than the government's national living wage. Practical, just, compassionate action one of the few employers in the sector who have done this. In addition, Methodist Homes has a hardship fund to provide relief for its workers when they hit hard times. And administering this fund has reminded me again of the terrible financial pressures on so many working people. Methodist Homes' response to the reality of working poor is one we can all be proud of. Another area of concern, very close to my heart, is the way we care for people with HIV. I'm a trustee of the London HIV Chaplaincy, which has benefited and continues to benefit enormously from the Methodist support since its beginnings. We are in the process of publishing a book which tells the story and reflects frankly, on the tragic consequences of misguided, often unthinkingly arrogant pastoral care offered to those living with HIV. It's terrifying, but ultimately a hopeful book. Do look out for it. Bala, I wonder if at this point we could become a little bit more personal. Can you introduce us uh, to our new vice president? Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the bit you wanted to do, is no, it? <laughs> no. Well, I'm a citizen of the world. I left Sri Lanka when I left school to study electronic engineering in Southampton. My working life was spent in telecommunications, along with colleagues from all over the world and of different cultures and different faiths. I'm a British citizen. Much to my Sri Lankan friends' annoyance, I passed the Tebit test. <laughs> An England cricket supporter. I'm a Methodist from an Anglican family. My mother registered me on the cradle roll, and like many young men, I was drawn to the Methodist church through the youth fellowship. All those pretty girls. <laughs> I worked my way through to to becoming a Sunday school teacher. My socialist awareness was born out of the work that the Youth Fellowship did in the slums of Colombo. I would not be here if not for my parents, who were devout Christians, totally immersed in Jesus. They installed in me the kingdom values that have stayed with me throughout my life. They've clearly been a huge and profound influence on you. Yes, indeed. And these family reflections remind me that there are a number of people I wish to thank. My sister, who traveled from Sri Lanka. Thank you, Akka, for your love and for your prayers. My friend, Bishop, President Bishop Reverend Arsiri Pereira, representing the Methodist Church of Sri Lanka, 
and Reverend Ebenezer Joseph, friend and mentor, the General Secretary of the National Christian Council of Sri Lanka. My friends at Southwark and Deptford Circuit, and of course, my dear friends in the London District, who have supported me through the years. And of course, to Michaela, or should I say, Madam President, the creative member of our partnership. We have been friends for many years. She is now a very special companion who holds me in prayer and is losing the battle to keep me in check. <laughs> I join the president in adding my thanks to those who have worked so hard to organize the conference. And of course, a special thanks to you, Rachel, for asking the questions. Finally, thanks go to my wife, my children, and my delightful five grandchildren, my dear wife and soulmate, Sylvia, whose abiding love of God and deep commitment to Jesus has sustained her and me. Thank you for introducing us to your lovely family. <laughs> But I know that another very important part of your life, Bala, has been your involvement in politics. Yes, my faith from its beginning gave me a passion for social justice. And I have always been deeply involved in politics. I was catapulted into politics in my late 20s when the TUC nominated me to serve on the Regional Health Authority where I encountered and challenged health inequalities. I have stood for election, known failure as well as success, canvassed the neighborhood, and I still do. I served two terms as a labor councillor in Lewisham, with one of those terms in the Inner London Education Authority. I saw the difference, my obvious non-British name had on the number of votes received. Mm -hmm. I learned the hard way that social justice gets done by hard slog, teamwork, building community support steadily year by year. But that's the way to make a difference. For instance, a significant achievement that I played a part in was writing and implementing the anti-racist statement for schools, colleges, polytechnics in inner London in the 1980s. I didn't know that. Well, <laughs> I was much younger and I was calling for the revolution now. <laughs> Bit older now. <laughs> These experiences have led on, me on to a number of other roles such as the chair of the University Hospital Lewisham, the vice chair of the Court of Central London Polytechnic, and I'm currently chair of Change Alliance, the wholly owned subsidiary of Christian Aid in India. So with all this going on, Bala, I'm finding it hard to imagine that you've had time to be involved in your local church and circuit. Well, I've always had a strong sense that wherever I have been involved, I have been sharing what God is doing. True in my secular career, true in the Labour Party and the trade union movement. People knew that if I was not in church, then I would be at a branch meeting. On an occasion when I apologized to my minister, Stephen Penrose, for missing a service, Stephen said something very important. He said, that is where God wants you to be. And how can we, your church, support you in what you are doing? The sense of solidarity is vital. The church needs to be alongside its people, wherever they are, battling with them against injustice. 
So on the basis of that experience, what do you find are some of the most important issues facing the church today? Proper attention to procedures and safeguards and safeguarding. Because we are doing good does not mean we can cut corners and not be professional. This is especially true of property and finance, as I have found in my time as a man steward in my circuit. Mm -hmm. That's clearly, it's clearly an important point, Bala. Um, but given the increasing complexity of these jobs, aren't they just very hard for volunteers in the local church? You're right. <clears throat> not just that, but many of us are not as able-bodied or energetic as we once were to take prop practical property tasks. We need to rediscover the resources of connectionalism and share our skills and our resources. So, if there is no people to do the job locally, or if you need to catch the bigger vision, turn to the experience of the circuit, the district, and then to wider Methodism. Gareth, I think, is nodding. <laughs> So it must be right. <laughs> At every point, there are people delighted to help us and build each other up. If that doesn't work, then we must pay for it, for the help we need. So we've heard that. What, what other issues do you think that uh, we're facing at the moment? There are. So many, but let me give you three. We need to honor the gift of administration. We honor those connected with worship, rightly so. But although we consistently undervalue administration, it is that calling in the church that enables all others. The importance of buildings to mission, comfort, Welcome, hospitality, teamwork, team of lay and ordained, to trust each other, to take risks, and when we make mistakes, not to lapse into the culture of blame, but to seize that opportunity to learn from our failures. Teamwork does not come naturally. We have to learn the skills and practice them to get them right. Can I just pick you up on that last point? Um, in so much of what you've told us this afternoon, the notion of working together and of solidarity um, come through as vitally important for you. Yes. Solidarity, human and divine community are the heart of my faith and are the heart of what it means to be a Methodist. I find it especially in two areas. I have to confess to having a reputation for enjoying good food. <laughs> That's true. Good food helps enjoy company and make friends and get to know people as they really are. A good meal together builds solidarity, hospitality, friendship. These are the values I delight in. They challenge loneliness and create belonging build friendships across cultures, faith, and class. Alongside good food and drink, I also thrive on good worship. And in worship, intercessions are very special to me. A privileged way of expressing solidarity, that's why where I go, where I meet these people, I will be asking them, what can we pray for you. I love that phrase of thriving on good worship, Bala. Could you tell us a bit more about what good worship means to you? Yeah. For me, worship is the point at which we meet our Lord, drawn in strength, and where we are inspired, renewed, and transformed for service. If that's to happen, we need thoughtful, challenging preaching and teaching, which engages with the Bible, but is aware of the contemporary issues 
and how we can respond to them. We need good music. And my special concern, we need intercessions which enable us to ponder in the light of God's word what we can do through the Spirit's inspiration and guidance to contribute to God's mission for the needy and challenge the collective policies and corporate structures that hurt, that frustrate or damage life and relationships. It's hard work for those called to lead, but that's what's going to make a difference. So it's down to this. Worship and preaching that doesn't call for and lead to transformation is only a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Bali, you've chosen as your theme for the year transforming hope. Can you talk to us a bit about why and what that means for you and for the wider Methodist Church? Hope is vital and it's right in the heart of our faith. Paul spoke about the idea that we are set free and at the same time bound, compelled by hope. So I believe I'm a prisoner of hope, convicted and held so tightly and irrevocably by a sense of Christian hope that cannot be resisted. It might be more comfortable to be despairing, cynical, fatalistic, but while hope is exhausting, it is also liberating, always anticipating God's kingdom, breaking in at any time, at any place. My dear friend, Ebenezer Joseph, the former president of the Methodist Church of Sri Lanka, who is here, pointed out to me that we live between the cross and the resurrection. Here is what he had to say. Hope, hope in God always comes when our expectations is shattered. So setbacks, destruction, Obstacles always strengthen our hope in God. It enables us to turn back to God. But on the other hand, uh, Christian life is also rooted in the cross and resurrection of Christ, where there is destruction, where there is, I would say, a public murder, innocent blood being spilt. But then you have on the third day, one who is risen from the dead, offering us new life, new hope, and fullness of life. So cross may be the setback, but there is always hope in resurrection. And may I always look at my ministry as in between the cross and the resurrection. So setbacks, uh, frustrations, we believe one day will bring new hope, the fullness of life. Christian hope is rooted in God's saving activity. It opens up new horizons, new possibilities, that are envisioned not by sinful human desires and aspirations, but by Christ and in Christ. That's really something much more, more dynamic, isn't it, than the sort of um, passive optimism that we so often hear as passing for hope in conversations and possibly even in our churches. Indeed. The journalist, journalist and TV presenter David Frost was once interviewed Archbishop Dudman Tutu with the words, I always think of you as an optimist. To which Desmond Tutu replied, I'm not an optimist, I'm a prisoner of hope. Optimism is a flimsy feeling upon which to build a transformed life. But Christian hope is rooted in infinite possibilities for transforming hurt into healing and fear into trust that spring forth from the resurrection. And you'll have to tell people someday the story about meeting Desmond Tutu. Yes. That's a good one. Yes. But we, we hear about this, this, this hope and this transformation, but at the same time, Bala, we recognize that numerically we are a church in decline and we see buildings that are becoming um, increasingly problematic, ministers who are overstretched, lay people who often feel guilty because they can't take on more and more things. Now obviously this isn't true 
throughout Methodism, but in such a context, what does hope mean for Methodists? I very much identify with what you have described. I'm not sure of the answer. But the middle of all this, apparent hopelessness, I know that God must be doing something, changing things, calling us to new journeys. So we have to be ready. We have to also recognize that some of our churches are growing, our youth are returning, and new Sunday schools are springing. Even very small communities like the Italian Methodists can do important things of God and God's world if our hope is alive. So, I agree with Lorena, ex-president, that God has not done with us yet. And what about the word prisoner that you use, prisoner of hope? How does that fit in and um, what is the relevance for Methodism? Very relevant and biblical. Christ has made us his prisoner so profoundly and set hope so deep within us that for me, the word prisoner really does reflect our call and service to which we are committed. We cannot escape it. Even if sometimes we want to walk away, God keeps drawing us back. Let me give you an example. Forgive me, it's very personal. There have been times when I've really struggled to carry out some of the lay roles I have undertaken. You know how it is. Your arm is twisted. You're persuaded. You feel honored to be asked. And you say yes. And then you wonder what on earth you let yourself into. <laughs> One evening, things are going the same way as they have been for months. I felt I was not making progress. I felt I needed to step down and resign. My colleagues persuaded me to carry on, which I reluctantly accepted, despite months of growing frustration. That evening, I was traveling home. I was disappointed with myself for having agreed to remain and to carry on. On the tra train, I was reading The Guardian. In those days, just below the editorial, there's a regular in praise of feature. That day, it was in praise of the Methodist covenant prayer. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Let me be employed for you or set aside for you. I felt intensely that God was speaking to me. You see, I had prayed that prayer so many years, but I had not heard it till that moment. I realized then that when we Methodists pray, we really do become prisoners of hope part of a church in the business of fulfilling the Jesus Manifesto spelt out in Luke chapter 4. God has appointed us to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim the release of the captives. I think of the Tamil tiger Kandalingam and Kranti the Dalit lawyer, the recovery of sight to the blind. I think of the way John Wesley, David Hardman, and the HIV chaplaincy challenge our blinkered views of the world. And I think of all those that I have worked with to strive to set at liberty those who are oppressed in politics, in health, in education, and of course, the church. I thank God we are all ranked together as prisoners of hope. Bala, Mr. Vice President, thank you very much and God bless you. Yeah, thank you.